As a professor of political philosophy from this region, teaching in the United States, these are some of, some of the questions I ask myself. What is the real aim of teaching philosophy in higher education? How do we undo the sense of isolation and alienation within the student body through the material we teach, especially for the Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian heritage students um, who don't have much representation in the United States? So going forward, I'm going to use a shorthand for that Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian, and it's going to be Amemsa. My answer to the above questions is by focusing on storytelling and developing personal narratives in the classroom. So why? Because the seed of every imagined future began with someone telling the story of how things were and how they could be better. The global slave trade began with a Portuguese man created and disseminated a narrative of unimaginable profits in the 15th century. The road to abolishing slavery began with the enslaved sharing their horrific stories and imagining themselves as free, telling them stories about themselves stories about how it could be after. Stories run the world, they create the myths we live in, and they bust us out of them. I also have a background in math and physics and worked at NASA at some point. So you might think coming from a science and now a philosophy background and landing on storytelling might be strange. Um, it's not. I've looked in a lot of places for the truth, whatever that is, and finally found it hiding between the lines of our personal stories. I've been teaching for some years in a philosophy department at a Texas liberal arts college before I figured out the power of storytelling. I was teaching like everybody else. Philosophy is very white and male. We teach Anglo-American philosophy. We read the canon, the Greeks, British American liberal thinkers, sometimes, very rarely, the French. We focus on determined themes and concepts. We ask similar questions in every single class. We write solid philosophy papers about those very well-defined those very well-defined concepts. I was teaching feminist philosophy and critical race theory. We were reading mostly women of color in my classes, so not a lot of men. I slowly started realizing that the way the people of color, especially women of color, wrote was very different. They were telling stories, their own stories and the stories of others. And while telling their stories, they were getting less abstract, you know, philosophy is very abstract, and getting more embodied. So let's say a Muslim student is trying to figure out their place um, as an American using philosophy. They're working towards arriving at a philosophical understanding of their world as Muslims, but they're doing so not only by reading abstract thousand-year-old texts, um, but by centering themselves and using the classroom as a place for self-actualization. Like, what does it mean to be a Muslim in the United States? Um, they're doing a philosophical processing that is not just heady, detached, clinical, and unbiased, although that's all, it always has its uses, right, that kind of philosophy. The student is primarily investigating their sensations, their thoughts and emotions around, say, Islamophobia in the United States, just as it appears to them, and in the process, creating a new embodied theory of reality that helps describe life for them. Slowly, I started asking my students to write their papers in the same way. And the results were amazing. Invariably, the last class of the semester was a sad affair, with students lamenting how the classroom, I mean, there were, there were kids crying in the classroom the, the last day, um, lamenting how the classroom had become a refuge for them to air out what they had had to keep bottled up to discuss not just their theoretical, but also their personal understanding, for instance, of what it means to be a Muslim in America. And the single most uttered refrain year after year, and I'm talking about Trump years, 
was, this is the safest place we have and now we're losing it. The safest public place we have and now we're losing it. Where are we going to tell our stories and process our selfhood now? And I was left wondering what they meant by safe. As I dug deeper, I learned what the students meant by safe. And, and this is the first message I want to leave you all with today. For those Muslim students, the classroom was where the stories that carried their true selves were being processed. So they didn't have to censor themselves. They didn't have to clip their wings, be careful. Who, you know, there was an open space, and they could just say it all. They could be fully themselves. Um, the classroom had taken on a spiritual, I'll explain spiritual in a minute here, self-exploratory aspect for them. By spiritual, I mean relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul. I'm not going to go into an explanation of what soul is. You all know what it is. Um, and I'm not talking about organized religion here. Um, and this, you know, uh, spiritual was a, as, uh, spiritual as opposed to material or physical aspects of our existence. In a philosophy class, student growth can be either trade-related, let's say, how to write better, right? Um, it could be intellectual, how to become better critical thinkers, or it could be spiritual, asking all the important questions that philosophy is supposed to ask. Um, or in the best case scenario, all of the above. We do trade related and intellectual knowledge well. But teaching our students to understand who they are as a human, their personal strengths and weaknesses, and learning how to work with those strengths and weaknesses, I'm not so sure we are excelling in that arena. This last type of growth is a spiritual endeavor. And even though philosophy department seems like the natural place for this kind of growth to happen, all these questions, important questions, life questions to be asked, um, I don't think our pedagogy supports it. Many philosophy classrooms in the US are more like intellectual gymnasiums rather than temples of wisdom. Learning who I am in the context of learning how to broker power to maintain a healthy self is a spiritual endeavor. I'm going to read that again. Learning who I am in the context of learning how to broker power to maintain a healthy self is a spiritual endeavor. I'll go further and say, and this is the second thing I want to leave you, all, uh, leave you with today. Um, and that is that, in fact, this one thing, learning who we truly are through learning how to ethically wield personal power is what students want from a university system. And it's something we are giving them less of every year. So inspired by my students and their need for safe spaces, um, I got crazy and I temporarily left academia in 2019. Um, I was also very tired of, of the environment uh, during uh, President Trump. And um, I founded and I got our nonprofit uh, Bolbol Collective off the ground. The goal of Bolbol is to create spaces where uh, Amemsa, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asians step out of their silos in the US, meaning Arabs hanging with Arabs, even specific Arabs <laughs> hanging with specific Arabs, right? Iranians with Iranians, Turks with Turks, Indonesians, with, you know, y'all you know what I'm talking about. And start talking about and processing, and this is the third thing I want to leave you with, the importance of this, talking about and processing undigested and outstanding cultural and historical issues. Patrick, you were just talking about this in the context of Germany and World War II. Bolbol constructs spaces around solid projects like learning how to lobby the United States Congress, right? Um, which is trade-related intellectual knowledge. An art that is heavily dependent on how well we can tell our personal narrative, the story of who we are and why we are here in the United States. To move hearts and minds in DC, I need to know who I am as an immigrant American and what I want first. So basically what I did was take this storytelling situation out of the classroom and brought it into the real world and brought those Amemsa students with me. Um, 
Bolbo's lobbying training program brings together Amamsa youth with distinct cultural and historical pasts, gives them a space to share their personal stories, and pushes them to realize, and this is the fourth thing, that they have what they have been missing, not being with each other, and how another world in which the Amamsa are connected and not fractured is actually possible and what that world feels like. So imagining a future where this, we're, we're actually connected and not separated. Every project where the Amamsa have a chance to share their personal stories, and that is the key ingredient of every Bolbal project, helps them step into their personal power, telling their stories of me, but in community leaving those who attend filled with a kind of energy, sense of ease, calm, and hopefulness they say they don't usually experience in most other social settings. Most everyone speaks about it in terms of a spiritual experience, something that touched their spirit and soul. I remember Bobo's first ever lobbying training in Washington, D.C. Lobbying is an action that attempts to influence lawmaking at the congressional level in the United States. So you basically go to DC, you talk to the Congress members, you try to convince them that a particular law needs to change. Um, the night we got off the plane, our group of close to 30 youth seemed understandably disoriented and alienated from each other. They were all carrying, story, uh, car all carrying stories about the other they had heard in their homes and communities. The Iranian kids were like, the Arabs, blah, blah. The Turks were like, everybody, blah, blah. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When I mentioned storytelling as something we would be doing a lot of, the response was confusion and shyness. A feisty young Arab woman, Syrian Arab woman, visibly disappointed, told me, I don't have a story. I'm not even sure what you mean by personal stories. Storytelling is what my grandmother does. We got lobbying training during the day through a DC outfit, and at night we would prepare the personal stories we would be using when we met with our Congress members on the fourth and last day of training. At night, we would sometimes be up well after midnight listening deeply and just getting to know each other. There was a lot of crying, lots of laughter. This was the first opportunity this youth had ever had to publicly reflect and step into what it meant for them to be immigrant Americans from this region. The same youth who said she didn't know what I meant by storytelling stood in front of her senator's staff member on day four with her hands on her hips speaking up while I stood in the back furiously filming like a crazy person through my tears, both of us were forever changed by the experience. She only knew how to do that because she was firmly pla uh, planted in her story of me. She knew who she was. I've been talking about Amemsa, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asians, coming together uh, through storytelling in the United States. But I wish we had more spaces for this kind of exchange in the region itself. Sharing stories has the power to transform us and our world. And isn't that, after all, the purpose behind getting an education? For that education, that exploration to happen, we need to create spaces so that the greater Islamic community can not only develop personal narratives, but also share them with each other. That is the one way our fractured, greater community can safely discuss the fears that keep us apart. My hope is that the Indonesian, the Egyptian, and the Iranian thinkers have these conversations grounded in personal narratives, not in a Western setting, as is the case right now, but in a safe regional backdrop like the United Arab Emirates. Here's to having difficult conversations and finding our way back to each other. Thank you.